Hello, and welcome to Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show. I'm Ted Bonnet. I'm Phil Proctor. Hey, Phil, how yeah. are you? Well, I've been traveling, and I'm I'm back. Uh, this month was uh, to be my 31st wedding anniversary with my darling late wife, Melinda. And so I went down and uh, spent some time in Imperial Beach with her little sister, Bonnie, who looks uncannily like her. And uh, and we celebrated her life and our life together. Nice. And as, as I was saying to you, I think we were like 35 years, 36 years together. Uh-huh. You know, wonder, just wonderful years. So I miss her terribly, but it was a good ride. And uh, we're going to have a good ride today because we have a very interesting guest. <laughs> yeah. And, oh, by the way, there is a wonderful commencement speech by Ken Burns. Yeah? Did I, he document it? No. Oh. He, he, he it, but it was documented. Was he holding a camera up to his own face? <laughs> I was so impressed by it. It was the quintessential commencement speech. It, what to, school? Um, Brandeis. Oh, and, and it was good, just good it's, uh, Ken Burns commencement address 2024. It's 20 minutes. It's so beautifully eloquent oh. and so uh, hip to the time right now that we're facing what the kids are facing. And oh, boy, cool. if you had to say something to graduates today, yeah. he really, really said it. It was a beautiful thing. It's worth going out of your way to see. I well, just... listen, we're going we're gonna to talk about some of these issues today uh, once again with our guest, who is... Marty Rifkin. Hi, I'm Marty. Hey, fellas. <laughs> How you doing? I'm good. <laughs> Marty is one of my best friends. He's a neighbor. He's just an overall mensch. He's just the nicest guy in the <laughs> yeah, world. Yeah, so why is he sitting here today? I mean, I have lots of friends, too. but you Well, know. he had more money than anyone else. He crisp $100 bill. Yeah, but well, the, the, that's uh, supposed to go to the station and not to it you. Did. It did. Oh, it did? Yeah. yeah. Actually, yeah. Ted owes me for tech support. <laughs> He's also my ah. tech guru. <laughs> Marty has coached me through Pro Tools. <laughs> well, that's great. Maybe... It, a, it's a microphone that's not <laughs> working quite properly. But he will uh, fix it in post. Would you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but Marty is also a multi instrumentalist, session musician, and a producer. And I would say one of the best pedal steel guitar players in the country. And I'm not uh, blowing yeah, smoke here. A, a little too kind, but thank you. He's amazing. Well, Play- that's because there aren't too many of them. Right, <laughs> right. right. <laughs> you know, but, out of the five of us. <laughs> but you're really pushing the pedal of the metal, aren't you? <laughs> right. I'm telling you. Marty has played with the very best. He's toured with Bruce Springsteen, Tom Petty, Jewel. You played with Glenn Campbell, Elton John, Weird Al Yankovic, Hans Zimmer, Dwight Yoakam. Boy, that must have been a full bus. Yeah, that, <laughs> I'm telling you, tell you that. <laughs> Billy Bob Thornton, Rosie Flores, Chris Shiflett of the Foo Foo Fight Foo Foo Easy Foo, for me Foo, to say. Foo, Fighter. Foo, Foo Fighters Foo. and John C. Riley. <laughs> yeah, that was yeah. pretty great. <laughs> he would do little little dates, you know. Yeah, he's not a major cool tours. dude. He's like great. Him, yeah, and he's you're really also great. a very busy, in demand record producer. I know, is, and is you it, have your own studio, right? Yeah, have my own studio. You've been there. Santa both Monica, both yeah. of you guys. Yeah, I was there to, to sing a song uh, uh, for Riverdale Country School, I think it was. I can't even remember the exact details, but I sang some kind of a song for the alumni. Right, right. 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 That had been written yeah. specially for it or something. That was a great day. It yeah. was fun. Oh, we had fun. You, so in your studio, which you've had forever, you've produced music for over 1,500 songwriters and artists, including Smokey Robinson, Hal David, Rita Coolidge, Creed Bratton. My goodness. How many years have you been done? Uh, I've been, uh, last August was, oh, so I guess it's going to be 31 years now. It's getting close. 31 it was, years? It was, it was my wedding anniversary. It's wow. 31 exactly. years. Exactly. Magic. When you got married, I decided to open up a studio. How cool is and that? that? And that was the year I moved in down the street from you. That was great. And it wow. didn't take us another 20, 20 years, years to meet. To meet. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it, it's it's a cool place. It used to be the Beach Boys rehearsal studios and oh offices. And is there um, cat litter on the ground there? <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, well, there might still be. Yeah. Uh, it might be fresh. But um, uh, I worked with a fellow named Nick Vinay, who was a sure you old must big name. Yeah, yeah, a great producer. He did Mac the Knife and and all. But he also did the Beach Boys, and so I worked ah, with him. Yeah. You know, the last few years of his life where I did all his music, and he would come in and tell me about how they had parachutes on the wall, and it was the Beach Boys' place, and he said, took me in the back room, and there was a hole in the ceiling, and 
said that was a, you know, Brian or, or one of them, maybe not Brian, but somebody fired off a gun, although I, I thought <laughs> it was an old light fixture. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> so I don't know. You know, there's a, a myth. Cool. <laughs> well, you have this, you know, you have the, the, again, the quintessential going west story. You moved out here from Baltimore mm-hmm. um, and you've been married to Mona uh, from Baltimore all these years. You have yeah. two grown sons. But you started living in a van out here, right? I mean, you were the starving musician that came out west. Totally the starving musician. And it was a great time to live in the van. Was it, it was, it was, you know, it, it wasn't like, uh, you know, being unhoused or anything. It was a choice because 1978. Yeah. So uh, uh, I joined the Santa Monica Y so I could shower and I could take a sauna every day just to yeah. say I could, you know, <laughs> even though I was living in my van. Nice. And I'd park over the bluffs and, you know, and, and all. It was, well, the whole thing was a big bluff, I guess. It was a time, big bluff. It? Yeah. Um, I came out to play bass and... Uh, uh, I went from having the biggest equipment in the world when I lived in Baltimore to having like the smallest amp possible to sit in my van, you know, mm-hmm. in my van. Mm-hmm. And I'd come out and if I'd sit in with a band, the bass player would always have to get off stage because you can't have two of them. And I always felt bad. Oh. So that's when I said, I-, I love pedal steel. Let me let me take a look at that. And then ah, so you could be. Wow. So this that's, was what, that's how it got. Yeah. You know, so as an adult, you took a, it wasn't like. Yeah. I, I when I was in my 20s. To, I early, guess that's kind 20s. of an instrument doesn't start with kids in elementary yeah, not school. Yeah. <laughs> or a marching band. Or a marching band. <laughs> right. <laughs> have to put wheels on it. Yeah. And, oh, wow. You know, roll that's it forward. Tough thing. So uh, you just kept playing gigs and meeting people? Well, I understood music and. As soon as I sat behind it, it's a very complex instrument. It's got pedals, knee levers, and it's all, you know, this mm-hmm. tuning and stuff. But it clicked, and it made sense to me. And in just a couple of weeks, mm. uh, I had already been playing an instrument called a dobro, which is kind of mm-hmm. similar-ish. But dobro, without is it Turkish? Or? Uh, the, the, it's, it's Middle uh, Eastern origin. There were two brothers, the Dobera, Dobera brothers, and they were from, I don't a think, Turkey. Pera, so, Dobera Dobera brothers. brothers, so they were Dobro. Oh, and, oh uh, wow. That's how that happened. That's how that happened. Wow. And then two weeks later, I got a gig. You know, at the time, the guy's like, oh, yeah, you can learn how to play while you're sitting in with us. And That's very cool. What drew you to the instrument? I just love the sound, you know. At the time, it was more of the kind of rockers who used it, maybe the country rockers like Poco, New Riders of the Purple Sage, sure. uh, Pure Prairie League. It was that kind of thing. And it wasn't until I got into it that I started getting deeper in the the guys who they looked up to. It was sort of a specialty instrument, so that Definitely. must have helped you gain momentum. Well, it certainly helped me get that first gig because they were like, you know, sit and play with us. We'll give you a few bucks. You know, they mm-hmm. just wanted the instrument there. Mm-hmm. But then I learned, and eventually, just a few years later, I was playing with everybody in town, but I would play steel, guitar, mm-hmm. harmonica, banjo, um, uh, even saxophone. So I always no, had a lot of wow. gear to take. Do, what, do you come from a musical family? <laughs> My mother sang, and she went to Peabody in Baltimore, which is kind of their Juilliard. Prestigious kind of thing. musical. She was. She sang in the musical theater a little bit. Oh, she did. Okay. But no, I think it was just wanting to learn it, and and like I said, I didn't know, but it clicked. Yeah, but you, you definitely had had the gene. Uh, I, yeah, music, I, I definitely know. will thank whatever gene I got that it was, <laughs> allowed me to kind of. Sneak by and, I think and do also, this forever. I think also it, it, you have this raw talent and, and exceptional musicianship, but it's also because you're just a nice guy. You're completely <laughs> unpretentious. Um, it, it, I mean, oh, we're going to change that to this. Well, yeah. What guest ever sends a bio with some uh, his level of accomplishment? It's half a page. It is half, yeah, <laughs> half a right. page at like 14 and big font. Print too. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't even... it's actually 16 font. I oh. needed to, to make it look a little. Uh, um, it looks more impressive. When it's bigger, uh, you know, right? uh, growing up, uh, you know, the musically. Uh, all I ever really looked at were the liner notes to see who was behind the scenes. So I think it's kind of, mm-hmm. yeah, not, it's like that. Yeah. You know, make it, yeah. you know. Yeah, but because, oh, so you've been going 31 years here in Hollywood, right? And No, no longer. I've just had the studio for 30 years. Oh, excuse years. me. That's right. So This has been since the 80s, so early you've, 80s. You've been, and this town hasn't tarnished you yet? Um, no. <laughs> Good. Good. And, and I have to say that... My experiences have always been good. Maybe, you know, I, I don't know. I think Definitely I, not jaded. I, or, I think mm-hmm. it, it comes from your personality. 
You know, oh, well, thank you. you. I really, I mean, I, I, I'm speaking from my own experience as an actor. You know, everybody says, "Well, who was the most difficult person you ever worked?" Well, I've never, I never worked with a difficult person. I can't imagine right? you would. No, yeah, because you... I was having fun and I was, you know, subordinate, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and and uh, cooperative, which is what theater is all about. Right on every level and it's always been fun yeah, and that, there's a magic to that because when we started working together mm -hmm. um i was in new york you were here with and and you brought in peter bergman and we were doing this comedy bit uh on an npr comedy, show comedy series comedy series called power power and you know you never asked me can i listen to some of your work no, no because <laughs> it was I... completely completely reckless of you I don't know. I mean, I, when somebody wants to work with somebody, that to me is a good sign yeah. right from the beginning. And but, then you, and if you're compatible, yeah. you, then you go forward. And then you have this oh, almost initial trust. It's like, wow, yeah. you know, that, that was so respectful. Well, you were, you were coming from a respectful position. You were producing a national uh, radio show, you know, about the culture. And you were even nice when I said we could only pay you $25 a week. Oh, I forgot that part. <laughs> what a fool I was. <laughs> it was public radio. <laughs> but, yeah, Marty's one of the nicest guys. And you've oh, had okay. such amazing experiences. I mean, one that comes to mind immediately, and you can see these things on YouTube. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as you can see, both Phil and I are wearing New Orleans Jazz Fest T-shirts today. That's Just right. coincidentally, but we That's are. Funny. And I went to Jazz Fest for 20 years straight straight and, and um, then some days stone exactly <laughs> <laughs> one of the most emotionally and powerful experiences was i had already been going for like 10 years when katrina hit right. and we had a crew wow we had a crew we'd meet every year 60 people from all walks of life tugboat captains and we were all friends for one weekend a year it was the most wonderful thing because it was just music and food and happiness did and you have joy. a name for your yeah. The, yeah the maggie crew the maggie crew the Mag which which where the, did that come from the um, it, it's an old limerick that I can't really say here. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, so, okay. okay. But, uh, you then we see, know it. In our... you, you see our flag hanging at the chart room, one of the great dives in the New Orleans. The chart room, yeah. right. Uh, in any event, the, the most powerful one was the one in the wake of Katrina. You know, we all decided New Orleans was only six months out, and it was a mess, but we knew New Orleans needed the the money needed the tourist money needed this the, the, the emotional support because jazz fest is that's the thing. right and we went there and it was an amazing experience oh, because we had a local who, who drove us around every year who grew up there and he took us down to the ninth ward when it was still washed out you know harry anderson's place got washed out oswald he had to relocate in uh, his club his club was gone yeah and he had a magic store and everything called oswald yeah, yeah. Because Oswald, exactly. Lee Harvey Oswald had quite a history in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. But anyway, what I'm getting to is <laughs> Bruce Springsteen played mm -hmm. that year as big, if not bigger, than the, the Stones playing this year because it was so emotionally momentous to come there uh, a half a year after um, a devastating hurricane and flood that changed the, the city forever. Yes, that's right. And here you were touring with Bruce at the time, and you went down to New Orleans to play. What, what, and you can see this on YouTube, just, what, YouTube, uh, Bruce Springsteen Jazz Fest? Uh, yeah, 2005, and, and, and maybe six. the Sessions Band or Seeger Sessions Band. You yeah. Know, but you can add that to it. Tell us about that. Well, it was kind of interesting. We were about to start a tour, and I think we were going to Europe. And he said, oh, beforehand, we're going to go down and do Jazz Fest. So I think it was almost a last minute like he knew what was going on down there it, it struck me as that was the case mm -hmm. and uh so there was a scramble and we got down there to play and it, it was it, it's like he had to give back to the city we, we did this version with all the verses or a lot of the verses of will the saints you know when the saints come marching in at the end mm -hmm. it was kind of like a slow it wasn't the big up-tempo the thing. funereal version correct right? and um so we were already geared towards that kind of a thing. Um, so then when we played there, it was kind of interesting because uh, it was like the art of him and and how he, he got the whole band to be a part of this whole thing of, of getting the audience to become his one. That he always did, managed to do. That was his magic. It, it, and it's the very it's, beginning. It still is. And, and watching it, there were about 70,000 people, I guess. And you know 35,000 are you know, it's I'm picking crowd. number. I'm just picking numbers out of the air. Are, are definite fans, and then you have the other people that are, you know, maybe you know, kind of, come, along, you know, some kind of fans, whatever. Yeah. And then I, I don't know if there was anybody who didn't care. 
But we would watch as we would do these songs and some of them, uh, like I remember we did a, a Jacob's Ladder and, and he would do the mm-hmm. chorus over and over until, you know, people would start to turn and sing and <laughs> it becomes infectious. Yeah, it was right. all this infectious stuff yeah. until he got 70,000 people <laughs> as one. And then he did a song, oh, My beautiful. City of Ruins. Ooh, and ooh. there's a part where everybody's supposed to put their hands up and, yeah. and, and all. And he got everybody crying. I mean, oh, the whole city and, and the whole crowd, I mean, was just... Well, they, I, they didn't need any more water. I don't know. What they, <laughs> they didn't. Great idea. Uh, and it, it was kind of um, awe-inspiring Beautiful. to not only watch how he did it, but to be a part to be of a it. Part and, of it. Yeah. and also being a part of it up on stage, we got to see mm-hmm. the people. You know, it yeah, wasn't that we right. were in it. We were actually, you know, as if yeah. it was on a screen in front of us. So it was, it was pretty... His stage performances are un, unbeatable. They're, he has a real gift for performing. And Billy Joel is like that, too, by the way. Elton John. I saw Elton sure. John on that stage. I saw Stevie Wonder sing Away the Rain. Right. Literally oh, yeah. drove the storm oh. away. It was the most amazing <laughs> new sunshine. Of your... oh, I love it. <laughs> it's like, it was just spectacular. But Bruce is really Magic of music. In, in, a, in a category of, of himself, by himself. He's just a remarkable, charismatic performer and brilliant. And you've worked yes. with him a lot. I mean, what... A lot. what What's your take being on stage with a guy like that? Um, well, it's a, it's a lesson and there's a connection, you know, because I've, I've known him and I've, I've worked with him uh, for so long, since the mid-90s, mm. you know, and, and uh, there's just, I, I don't know, it's just a, a connection. Like, you, you zone in on what he's doing. Uh, if you ever watch them, you can see that everybody in the band is watching him the whole time because uh-huh. it's... Anything can happen at any moment. He knows how oh, to get wow. that out of all wow. his players, out of the audience. It's, you know, not scripted. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, so it, it's, it's really a lesson. And, and what it taught me, uh, besides all the little musical tricks, because, you know, yeah. we would rehearse a song that we never heard before and come up with the arrangement and sound check. And you never knew Ooh. if it was, you know, we'd do a couple and you didn't know which one was going to be on the show, blah, blah, blah. So how he comes up with arrangements and all. But the bottom line is he's nice. He's a nice, nice man. Yeah. And I always say when people say, what's he really like? I'm like, he's who you want him to be. And so then if I ever worked with anybody else who has any kind of an attitude, uh-huh. you know, uh-huh. uh, I, I kind of chuckle to myself, like, if you only knew how to really do it. Oh, that's <laughs> you know something, what I mean? yeah. <laughs> that's the thing. It's like you're not at that you know, yeah, it's a mm-hmm. sense of insecurity, I guess, right? I think it could be. You know? And uh, um, he's just really he's kind, there. and he's nice, and he he loves musicians around him. You're there because of you know he's casting your musical voice, and he's yeah. now you, you you're not the E Street Band. He has no. two different. How does that work? Well, he has the E Street Band. Mm-hmm. They're out right now. In fact, on a great tour. We just saw him when they were in town, mm-hmm. uh, and then. He'll do solo albums, which is what I've been on a bunch of, mm. you know, uh, I, you know, maybe all since since I started playing with him. That wasn't a, a featured E Street band. And then there was this uh, time where he did the Seeger Sessions band, which became the Sessions band. That's right. They had done a record with a, a bunch of players in New York um, for – they did a song or two, I think, for – a Pete Seeger album, mm-hmm. and it was kind of really loose in the horn section. It was actually what ended up going to Jazz Fest. Mm. And so then a couple years later, they did a couple more songs, a few more songs, and then they realized, hey, we have an album here. And so then they did another session. It became the album. Then he was ready to go on the tour, and so I was invited to that. And being the guy from California, I didn't know, okay, what's going to happen when I go to New York and it's oh. all these New Yorkers? They're still my best friends. Mm. Oh, they, wow. they truly are. And uh, my other best friends <laughs> that aren't local. <laughs> it turned into this, this wonderful thing. Did so you, I did, did that. Did you find it at, at all difficult to be on the road during your career? Uh, you know, a bus and truck? I mean, how did they – what were those it, experiences it, it, like? It's interesting. That experience was great because, you know – if he does it the right way, and 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 you, you have time in the different cities, and yeah, and yeah. you know you can hang with so many people in the audience. You go to a city, and yeah. you know there's 
you know, so many thousands of people there, and then you go out afterwards and you bump into yep, them. That, and hap- that happened with Fireside Theater. I could imagine Proctor you guys Bergman, did that. Yeah. We slept on many a, a strange couch, you know, <laughs> and had many a free meal. <laughs> um, yeah, but, but actually, I don't tour a lot. Uh, I'm mostly all in the studio, and uh, uh, because of that, originally when I was first going to start touring a bit, uh, you know, early on I was doing clubs, you know, which was great, yep. learning how to do the craft. And then when I – the first time I was going on the road, like a real road thing, was with a woman named Rosie Flores. And my wife and I had been married already five years, and she said, well, with you gone, I think it's time to have a kid. <laughs> so that a little – it was very romantic. A little part of you would be here while you're gone. Oh, oh. sweet. Sweet. So uh, we had my son, and I said, oh, I'm not going to miss this. So I stopped going on the road. So uh-huh. she was stuck with both of us. <laughs> <laughs> that backfired on her. <laughs> yeah. um, and so while the kids were little, you know, the only the only real thing I did is I, I did go with Bruce to something in New York, you know, so I would go there for a, a Rolling Stone magazine TV thing or whatever. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, I stayed off the road until my kids were, okay, you know, it, until – what he, I did with him on the road, but anybody else, I kind of waited until mm. the kids were grown. So everybody thinks I'm a road guy, you know. But, but good no, choice, really, though. Yeah. Good choice. Oh yeah, and we, li- you know, we live in Santa Monica. And it's yeah, know, why tour? Why tour? <laughs> um, we're, just, we're speaking with Marty Rifkin, um, musician extraordinaire, here on the Sexy Boomer Show with Phil and Ted. And uh, you said you came originally from Baltimore. Uh, I'm going to tell you a Baltimore story. Mm-hmm. I was on a tour with uh, The Sound of Music when I was younger. I played Rolf the Singing Nazi. You are 16 going on 70. You know, I was, I, was it know, billed that way? Was it the Singing Nazi? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Rolf is actually turns out to be a good guy at the end. Yeah. He lets them go, you know. Yeah. Uh, anyway, in, uh, in Baltimore, a bunch of the what we call the bull nuns uh, wanted to go to a, a strip show and uh, invited me along. And it was a burlesque show and actually had burlesque comics doing old burlesque routines, right. which just great knocked stuff. me out. It oh, was yeah. great. But they had a rule there. The girls couldn't take off their G-strings. So what the girls would do was that they would unsnap it on one side and move it over and snap it on the other side. So they were technically still wearing their G-strings, but gee, it was, it was exciting. You know? So that, that's my favorite Baltimore story. Those are know? good tour stories. You, yeah, know? you might yeah. as well do that while you're on tour. Yeah, that was probably at a place called The Block, that, which was an okay. area. I think it was down around what they call Reed Street. I, I was young when I left, so I never went. Okay. And and, and did that. I, I'm young, I mean, early 20s, but uh, probably when I was old enough to go. Yeah. Uh, by then, I might have left. You worked with uh, Glenn Campbell. Uh-huh. And so I YouTubed some Glenn Campbell interviews with uh, the Wrecking Crew and the, right. the great session players. And you do a lot of session work. And what right. struck me about... All of it was just the camaraderie. And, I mean, when you have old friends and you talk about the good old days, right. those guys really had good old days, as tough as it might have been at times. Hey, you know Glenn Campbell played on the first Firestone Theater album. Oh, he no. did? Yep. Uh, Jimmy Guercio was uh, uh, a good, uh, a powerful manager then, uh, Chicago, etc. cetera. And... Uh, I remember it was kind of a shock. We go into the studio, and there's this little band there to to help us, you know, with our first album, waiting for the electrician or someone like him. And Glenn Campbell was one of the musicians. Right. He was part of the wrecking crew. He was a yeah. guitar player. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that cool? I mean, my That's God. Way cool. In retrospect, you know, woo. You had royalty on there. We sure did, man. It was yeah. a great what you? How was your experience with Glenn? I loved him. Uh, we got along great. It was... It was kind of right around the beginning when he started having, you know, Alzheimer's. Mm-hmm. And uh, so there would be, you know, little moments that you could see. And uh, yet I knew to talk to him about the past. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would, that's I would right. show him pictures of his guitar and he would tell me all about it. So yeah. we really connected well. I asked him once about, uh, you know, Brian Wilson uh, when they were working together because he was part of the Wrecking Crew. Oh, who work I, I on good vibrations, and I mentioned something about the uh, the theremin, you know, yeah. and uh, 
He said, yeah, we were there, and, uh, but we didn't play. We, we just had to wait, and it, it took a while. I said, did you, have, did you get antsy waiting? And he went, oh, no, I was watching a genius. <laughs> uh, you know? And you could just see he went right to where – well, he, he was, he, he, and he played guitar beautifully till the very end. He never lost that. No, 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 never, never lost it. And uh, uh, he was kind of, he was kind of wonderful. And and the people involved were great. And and we did a lot of, uh, uh, we did a lot of work. I played on on a couple of the records. And then if if he had a certain, he had a band, but if he had a certain show that they you know wanted to augment, then I would be a part of it. In fact, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine named Kim Bullard who plays with Elton. You probably saw him if you saw Elton at Jazz Fest. Uh, he's the other keyboard player. Mm-hmm. He's a uh-huh. riser, and, and he's just wonderful. And so uh, Glenn was doing the Jules Holland show. Did you ever know who Jules Holland He was in Squeeze, but he's got a great show in oh, the UK. Oh, yeah, Jules Holland. Yeah, sure. Jules Holland. Yeah. And uh, so they brought Kim and I there. And you were talking about the camaraderie yes. of, of session players. Uh, we were – Flying overnight for a, a BBC thing and all, and uh, well, we left, you know, like I said, overnight. And so we each took an Ambien, <laughs> and we ended up talking until the plane landed the next morning. <laughs> oh. We never let it kick in because there was just so much catching up to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. And uh, the whole studio thing is exactly like that. We, uh, I look at myself much more like that than yeah. you know the the. the Touring guy, obviously, because of what we said. You still do a lot of it. I mean, you a uh, lot of it. Yeah. Uh, it. It's not quite the same as it was because we used to actually up until the pandemic. I used to work at Capital with a group of you know different groups of people, which was great. But now it's a little more modular. You know, mm-hmm. y- you do your overdub at your studio. If somebody else records. Oh theirs yeah, or everything's theirs. become much more fragmented. We were talking about that on, on the ride over here today. Uh, the fact is that because of social media and because of these uh, omnipresent uh, phones and everything, people, especially this particular generation, they don't go out as much. No. Uh, I, does it affect the club crowds too? I don't. I don't know if it does. I think music still attracts people to get together. I, I think it does because of the pandemic ending and the clubs opening and it was back like up. A celebration. But, but I don't do very much of that. I, yeah, I'm just so hoping you, yeah. that it's all back because I have so many friends that but play you, you clubs. Do, um, you do some great shows over at McCabe's in Santa Monica. M- McC- you're right, in that kind of place. That's such a that's, friendly venue. That's it? a friendly venue, venue. And, and it's great. People care about the nuance of what you play. That's right. You know, they can hear it. You know, you're, how loud do you play a note? Well, I mean, how loud do you play a note? <laughs> how soft do you play? <laughs> now you played, um, that you, something you've been doing forever is something called the Dylan Fest, uh-huh. which you did just, it's every Memorial Day weekend, correct? Uh, well, next year I found out it's going to be on Mother's Day. Ooh, so wow. I guess it's some kind of a holiday in May celebrating Bob Dylan with... This just happened on Saturday. What, Saturday. Where is it? What's about? It's, at the, it's a great little show. I shouldn't say little because it's big. There's quite a few, you know, many hundreds of people. It's a festival at the Torrance Cultural Center run by Andy Hill and Renee Safier. And uh, you, if you look up their names and, yeah. and, and Dylan Fest, you can learn about it. But there's 50 musicians involved, uh, wow. 65 songs, and, and out of those – 50 musicians, a lot are the acts, and then we have a house band, and I've been in a house band, and this particular year, a lot of other people, when the house band isn't backing them up, hmm. a lot of them will say, hey, Marty, you know, will you play with us? And, you know, we never rehearse or anything, but it's fine. And this year, out of 65 songs, I played 55. Oh, <laughs> Moses. That must have really tired your fingers out. <laughs> um, no, I felt pretty good. I yeah. was kind of... It, it, it felt good. It's actually from playing steel. It's it's my butt gets sore. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. From sitting. Secrets of the trade. <laughs> Secrets of the right. trade. You know. And you just did something for the voice. I was just, yeah. Last week I was on the voice. What's know, that, what is that about? Uh, they had a they had a song that you know one of the artists that was going to play there. And mm-hmm. this is kind of how it works with me. I, I never know. Uh, it's it's kind of sometimes hard making certain plans, and I'll say to people, I'm not sure because I get these last minute calls. Oh, absolutely! And, and sure. out of the blue, uh, you know, they they called from the Voice and uh, said, "Are you available?" You know, for this day rehearsal and this day show, and I, I mean, you know, sure, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but that kind of stuff happens all the time. So it was it was backing up an artist, uh, this uh, uh, Gina Miles, who had won a couple years ago, and and. It was great just to meet everybody, meet the band. The band is yeah. just brilliant. Yeah. But those kind of things happen 
all the time when I least expect it. I'll get a call for it, something. It puts and, you in a wonderful position of adventure, <laughs> really. When you think it's about all it. adventure. I, I'm with you, and and I I'm so happy to have the opportunity to, you know. Well, yeah, it's sort of timeless too. I mean, I mean, I've got a lot of musician friends who come and go because they just uh, well they had hard lives in the beginning, so right, it didn't right. age well. You've aged beautifully. I don't know how you're doing that. Is are you a vampire? Is that... <laughs> no, it's the do lighting. A, the it's the lighting. Do you have a T-shirt of Dorian Gray <laughs> in your closet? <laughs> no, I always just like decided early on I'm going to set up soft focus in front of my face. <laughs> Nobody can notice. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, there, there's a longevity. I think it's because I was never hunting for, you know, to, to me, the, the, there were just little small victories of just doing any little little things yeah. and, mm-hmm. and you do a good job and, and you want to make it Hey, listen, you, we, we, we stay young in, uh, in the entertainment world because we enjoy what we're doing and it's re- fulfilling to us. It, it's, you it's, know? It's exactly. We don't, have a lot, we don't have a lot of worry lines, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, – uh, what's kind of interesting is that I work with a lot of young musicians and young artists. Good. And as you know, just did something recently, you know, 17 year old. Uh, and uh, they, they look up to us with the knowledge that we've learned. Whereas I think if I was, you know, 25 and was going to meet somebody my age mm-hmm. musically, we might go, well, you're from a different age. Musical mm-hmm. era, yeah, and, yeah. You know, I was. I would hope I wouldn't do that, but I could understand that I could. And nowadays, you know, and and I do a lot for my son, you know. And, and oh, your son is a s- successful musician. Yeah, as well. he, he's great. It, it goes by Pink Sock, and uh, here in L.A. Here in L.A. and uh, he does really well. And, and uh, but he's you know he's fantastic. And so I'll he'll bring his stuff in and I'll mix his stuff, even though it's, what's he play. You know, uh, he plays everything on his records. He plays, you know, guitar and he gets keyboards, the drums. Wow. You know, did he just kind of does everything. Wow. Sings like. Did he know. shadow you? Did he look up to you? Mm, no, it was kind of a. Uh, he did his own independently. Path, yeah. You know, and, and it was funny. I saw a thing today, uh, uh, like one of those memes that you see. You know, yeah. it's like you know when a kid is five, what does he think about dad? You know, and then he's ten, and by thirteen, ah, dad doesn't know anything. You know, <laughs> right? Dad would, yeah. Not saying he did that. You know, and and it wasn't until they're older. Well, maybe dad knows something. <laughs> wow, dad knows a lot more than I thought. <laughs> yeah. You know? And. Uh, I think it was good because he's he, kind he of— He got hip to that earlier. Uh, well, yeah, but he learned how to do what he does. And I think it's good because it made him creative in his I hear in, in his way. Yeah. And, uh, and what, what about your other son? Oh, he's a, you know, a, a, a very great— computer guy up in silicon valley oh he's a super he's okay. an uber nerd i mean yeah. he's yeah he's, well he's, except he's, yeah he's, he's he's not nerdy but yeah, yeah. In, in that world so does he take after your wife or uh... um no yeah i mean they, they all do she's she's been a great influence on all of us i mean sure. she's a she's a perfect musician wife you know musician's wife she's a great musician's mother and she's <laughs> a great you know nurture you know my yeah, other you, son, you, you know out. Devin. What what he does, um, very supportive, and and we have a very tight nuclear family. Wonderful, and you know Mona. A is nuclear certain, family is a blast. <laughs> now, so you've been around doing this forever, uh-huh. and music. Not yet. <laughs> now musically, <laughs> things have feels changed. it. You know, yeah. I, my daughter who is turning twenty one, she knows the eighties repertoire. You know, she has contemporary musicians that she likes to see and listen to, but they have this very strong rooted understanding and feeling about music. I try to find new music. It seems like it's difficult to recreate the, 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 just the, the raw the, the originality the of the 60s and 70s and yeah. even some of the 80s. And as I've said, I'm into YouTube right now, and I, I just Googled Johnny Be Good and watched... Um, Jimi Hendrix perform it live, Johnny Winter <laughs> perform it live, and uh, just watched the guitar playing of that era, late 60s, early 70s, which yeah. was just Astounding. remarkable. What's your perception of how the industry, where is it going? Well, I'm not sure where it's going to go. Uh, the thing that was different in the 60s and the 70s, and, and I guess actually through the 80s, uh, there was radio. And, mm-hmm. you know, you were in New York, 
uh, where were you? From? I was in New York at the time. At okay, so you and I was in Baltimore, but somebody out here. We had. Oh, the you're same... talking about the eighties? Oh no. no, no. Let's say the sixties and seventies. Yeah, the mm-hmm. uh, the sixties. I was in New York, and then came, uh, came out, and the Firestein Theater was created. So I was kind of bicoastal. And and, and at the time. exact same time, we all heard the same Elton yes, John song for twenty six yes, we weeks. That's right. Okay, we all heard Rocket Man, no matter what. Yep. And so. That kind of connected everybody to Even know more the, so when we were younger in the 60s, because you and I are the same age, right. Top 40, um, the Motown sound. I was going to say, yeah, we, we all heard the Supremes, the same exact song. That's, that's at the, right. At the same. And it was never tiresome, because it was just such great music, you didn't mind the rotation. Well, and actually, when I, I always say to people, when you hear a new song, listen to it two or three times, mm-hmm. okay, because... That's when it starts connecting to you, and that's what we had. Like you said, it was the same song over and mm-hmm. over. It didn't get old. No. We didn't go, oh, you know, Tracks of My Tears, that's on again? No, you, you, it's you like, had, yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? singing along. I remember I had a group of friends. We used to harmonize together down in the subways in New York. See, people in our um, boomer category, right. you know, who have lost touch with music. For someone who's looking to reconnect, this vitality, where do you find your music? I mean, people come to you, obviously, but where would somebody find their music now yeah i i don't know what everybody's experience would be i guess you know we all go online and listen to one of the streaming services and then they set up algorithms yeah Yeah, and and i've discovered well i mean you're right you're right uh i i don't know i I have a feeling a lot of people our age do the rabbit hole down Mm -hmm. youtube and end up uh, i know for me music went from uh more record stuff although i listen to that all the time because you know uh to seeing live performances on YouTube. Mm-hmm. So I'll, yeah. I'll get lost more on that. Like you said, you looked up that song, but you were looking up live performances. That's right. And yeah. um, so that that's probably where I think a lot of us might go to to see something. Again, it's it's fragmented. It's, it's not the same kind of communal experience. Right. Until you start, you, people come together, like the Jimmy Buffett concert that I was at, the tribute concert. You know, 17,500 crazy parrot heads there. Right. And, <laughs> and, and uh, I know uh, my friend uh, Jamie Alcroft, who was there, uh, asked somebody, said to somebody, so this is really like a religion. He said, oh, no, man, it's a cult. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cult and it's occult because it's hidden. Yeah. You know, it's not like you're, you you don't get that many opportunities to get together to celebrate together right. uh, the music. And I think that's what's great about radio, too, and where you can still find a college radio where there are young people sharing their musical taste, XLU here in town, you can hear some good music. I think on satellite radio. But what I really miss are the musicologists that were DJs that would came on and would, would mm-hmm. had the, their finger on the pulse of what was going on musically right. and also on how that was reflected culturally. The only thing I can find, and the only reason I subscribe to Sirius XM is for one channel, The Loft, that's where I can sort of reliably be turned on to good music. It's, and I know they're listening because if there's something that's off, off kilter and you go like, oh, I do not want to hear that. And it's very rare for me, but I do. I probably think a lot of people are doing that. And they probably can see that. And that song goes right off. That's done. And you don't because see that like, again. Wow, look there. at the tune out on this printout. It's, right. it's interesting. I'm going to be uh, back in your stomping grounds. I'm going to be uh, performing in, in Washington, D.C., hosting an evening uh, b- uh, which is uh, under the aegis of the cellar door, a uh, great club down there that you know, you right, know well, right, too. Yeah. And uh, uh, it's to help musicians, up, up and coming local bands and things. And it's going to be at that Hamilton Club. The old Hamilton Club. I've never been to there. There, it costs ten dollars to get in. You know, right? Hamilton Club. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, try, try, <laughs> try the veal. All hour. <laughs> try the veal. But anyway, the next day I'm going to be interviewed by my friend Adele Abrams, who was on our show, uh, who was was a DJ back in the progressive rock days. WHFS. But she's going to be curating an interview with me about Firestone Theater and Procter and Bergman and all that. And I'm bringing certain you know drop ins. Uh, some musical stuff, and uh, it's the same thing. The spirit still exists mm-hmm. out there. Right. It, you know, they're more local than they are national. Well, what, 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 you know, how is the business for musicians now? Um, it, it, I think it can be a little difficult. It, it's hard for me to say because I have my thing, and I, I've always done, you know, well, and it just stays yeah. the course. Um, 
it, it's a lot harder because the days of being able to uh, earn a living off of the music sales mm -hmm. yeah. is not really That's there. Really it, you have to deal with, you know, instead it's more live performance, it's, it's merch, yeah. it's placements. Yeah. Um, this is why the ticket prices at concerts are so high now. It's one of the reasons. It's also uh, a yeah, monopoly. You know? Yeah, yeah, there's, there, there's that as far as the, you know, it depends on what level. Yeah. Uh, the thing is people that are, I, I keep wondering what's going to happen maybe 12, 15 years from now when the classic acts aren't touring anymore. Mm -hmm. How are the re arenas going to fill up? Because there's a lot of new artists that won't, won't be able to fill 18,000, 20,000 yeah, seats. Not, yeah. you know, because or, of fragmentation? Yeah, and, and stadiums. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the Stones oh, will yeah. play the stadium or, mm -hmm. you know, Bruce will play the stadiums. But when they're no longer doing it, you know, for whatever reason, yeah, yeah. who question. is going to? I mean, you know, obviously uh, Taylor Swift or whatever, but there's not a lot of... Uh, of her of type her, of acts right. that can fill those things. So, um, Billie Eilish, I suppose, is a big draw, but mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I just don't know what the the. So I'm yeah, curious how be? the hockey, yeah. you know, arenas are gonna, uh, what they're gonna do. So you're gonna see smaller venues, is what you're thinking? Well, you, you're gonna have to because once again, we all heard satisfaction at the same time, and so the Stones became part of our. DNA. That's right. <laughs> but with what's out there right now, no fault of the artist. It's really the fault of uh, not getting everybody on the same page. You just can't have that. Well, you base. know, I'm I'm a proud MAGA, uh, making America groovy again. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know where that was going to be aimed for. Um, uh, yeah, so it, it, I'm curious to see, what, but I, I, I don't know. I, I knew streaming was going to come, but I didn't know in what form. Well, you you produce mm -hmm. all the time right. new artists, and you bring your seasoning to them and your your judgment, and you just help them really come up with a professional sounding uh, product, if you will. Um, what 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 are their pr prospects? Uh, well, it depends what they want to, how hard they want to work at it. You know, uh -huh. like I said, mm -hmm. you, you could get. Certainly placement is a thing that's important now so that you can get your following. Mm -hmm. uh, do they do a channel, a YouTube channel? Mm -hmm. um, are they performing live? Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of groups that you'll never hear of that can fill 10,000 seats somewhere. You know, yeah. I hear that all the time. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. just like, well, that, that would be fine. Because if you're not giant, you don't have the giant overhead. Right. So yeah, it, what true. you have to do is a business plan of some sort of – Okay, what do you need to get out of music to make your living, if indeed you want it to be, a, you know, a living? And not everybody wants it to, to, you know. And I guess the festival circuit is is a, is a good thing. Uh, uh, that's another one. Uh, music is kind of interesting because we hear about the music business. We've heard that all yeah, our lives. Sure yeah. And you get into music and people around you going, wait, you know, you're in the, do you, do you really think you're going to quote, make it, you know, why are you doing that? Are you done doing the music thing yet? Blah, blah, blah. Huh. And all these people hit you with that are the same people who go golfing and you have to turn around and say, are you ever going to be in the PGA? Yeah. <laughs> you do it because yeah. you love it. Uh, right. And I know so many people who have to make records because they love making records and making their music. And it doesn't matter that they're not going to be the next Billy Joel, you know what I mean? Right. Um, and the technology is so much more accessible now, so people can produce at home and get it to a place where they can at least get started. But then they come to a person like you for the uh, for, finesse. For the finesse and the right. Well, well, quite often, I, I think some of it might be, you know, uh, and like I'm not a snob. <laughs> My kids and I always would get into the fun, fun arguments of, you know, uh, we know, Dad, nobody sucks. It's just not the music you like to hear. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Uh, they don't buy that. No, uh, I understand. Right. But that's how I look at it. So if somebody does a lo-fi thing, and maybe it wouldn't be pleasant for us to listen to, yeah. if they listen to it and love it, then I think, you know, I just can't imagine somebody making a record and going, I hate this song. I hate the way it sounds. Yeah. Let's put it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that, that's the money. That's the money aspect of it. Right. That's the business side of it. Right, right. It's like they're trying to save. I mean, they should do it, or or could do it. Right. You know, maybe elevate the level. Um, that's why I was never snobby. I could work 
like like at my place, I could work with one of the greatest songwriters in the world, like a Hal David or somebody. And then the next day, somebody who wrote their first song. But if they can learn something from how we have to tweak the song and how we have to make it sound That's a certain great. way, yeah. then their next song will be better. And, and, and you never know if the tenth song that. is the one that we all go. And you wow. mentioned Hal David. Uh-huh. Uh, tell us a little bit about Hal. Uh, Hal was great. I, I remember... Uh, I first started, you know. Who, our, who was he first? I mean, for people who may not oh, be familiar. Uh, he was, he wrote the lyrics to Burt Bacharach's songs. Do you know the way to San Jose? Raindrops keep falling on my head. What's it all about, Alfie? Mm, wow. uh, he was just a, a brilliant. And uh, I remember he would do stuff. I think he co-wrote with a fellow named Ken Hirsch, who was also a very, you know, well-known writer. And I remember the first time he came to my place, you know, I had, before I moved in the studio, it was in an apartment, in my apartment. And uh, I remember he knocked on the door, and Mona answered the door, and he goes, is this the right place? <laughs> you know, two flights up and all that. Uh, but we hit it off great, and it was, it was great. And once I moved in the studio, he was back in a bunch. And the thing that made him great was he would take the melody, mm-hmm. and he would actually do the perfect syllable versus the, the melody note and never cheat. Like it was, if the melody was, you know, do you know the way to San Jose? Right. He didn't go to San Francisco, <laughs> <laughs> which a lot of writers do. They kind of fudge things to uh-huh. get the exposition in. And he would just write the most brilliant, you know, raindrops keep falling on my head. You're absolutely you know, right. Yeah. It was never, f- yeah. and, and I learned that craft from him. Hmm. Of you know how exactly. That By was. the way, we should pay respects to the late Richard Sherman, uh, who uh, you know did all the great Disney yeah. music, yeah. and uh, was also a friend uh, of mine. He was a funny, fun character. Both he and his brother Robert were amazing. We're, they were out there. Yeah, know, he was brilliant. He was brilliant. Yep. Yeah. So, so we talked about the business. Now let's just uh, in, in the time we have left uh, talk about the art. The, mm-hmm. the art and the craft of your work. Now, you play the, the pedal steel, which is a very expressive, complex instrument. Mm-hmm. I mean, so they call you up, and, like a Springsteen. They, they call you up, Marty, can you play? I mean, where do you go in your mind when you play with these, these, all these diverse artists? How do you fit into the flow and bring it up with them? Uh, I think the first thing you have to do is... I, I call it big ears. You got to hear everything going on. It's mm-hmm. it's an expressive instrument. It's um, it's usually in response to what you hear around you, or that's how I treat it. Mm-hmm. I, I don't try to do a rolodex of licks and things like that. It's more uh, what responsive. It, yeah, responsive. And what is the role? It can be a very evocative instrument. It can, you know, it can also be that twangy thing. Yeah. You know, whatever. Mm-hmm. But I look at it more orchestral. And so there's certain colors that it has, which, you know, I've learned. And, and it's, it is complex, but once I start playing all of that, it's like driving a car, you know, the clutch. And you don't think about it yeah. when you're actually mm-hmm. driving. Mm-hmm. And I have pedals. I have knee levers. You know, it's where do you play the string? Where do you put the bar and blah, blah, blah. And uh, what I try to do is get lost in that moment. I, I'll know uh, mathematically before the song what's supposed to happen. But then when you start playing, uh, just got to get away from yourself and just listen to everything around you. Singer sings a line, you respond. Mm-hmm. Singer sings the next, you know, to, to how they're feeling. Yeah. Singer sings the next line, you have to respond to that feeling, but you can't forget what you played yeah, in just, between just, right. the other line. And so you have to, uh, and, and for me, it, it's, I just try to get away from myself and it's never about the instrument or me, I've worked enough where it's it's not like oh, listen to what I can do. So, I, I never want yeah, that. It's yeah. I, I've done it enough that I don't have to. Are you consciously counting? No, no unless there's a moment that you have to. Uh-huh. Um, but no. Do you hear the music in your head and you're translating it into your instrument? Uh, I, I hear the the vibe or the color of what I'm going to play, yeah. so to speak. Um, but no, not the notes, because that wouldn't be fair. Then I'm reciting. And and a lot of, of it, uh, I think one thing that I was always able to do is kind of a fast twitch improv thing. You know, in other words, uh, 
somebody can say, take it. You know, I don't know the changes necessarily, but yeah. as soon as you hear it, but I can, re, you know, I can play over it on top of those and solo, but I usually blank out my mind Isn't that cool? for that oh, moment. God, yeah. Otherwise, I feel like I'm reciting and, and I don't think that would be constantly creating. Yeah, you've used visual terms a couple of times here, color. Right. And do you visualize what you do? I mean, do you, when you say these colors, what do you think? No, I guess colors is another word for tonal. Yeah, tonal a expression. A tonal expression. Uh, is it going to be sweeping? Yeah, yeah. You know, or mm -hmm. is it more uh, noty? And uh, it's very similar to singing for me, you know, singing in musical comedy. Where, well, you, you, you're, you're expressing emotions and ideas through the music, and it can change, too. Mm -hmm. It can change. You know? When I do sound design... I regard it as painting a picture. Right. We Perceptions. did that with Firestein Theater. Yeah. The mixes were extremely important because we were putting yeah. characters in various places. Right. It was all visual, visualizing in our head. Well, and, and I'll do that a little bit with the mix because, you know, we're staring at a screen and all that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I know, like, like recently I had to learn something for some, it's, whatever it was, and I put the song into Pro Tools, and then I learned the parts, and then I found I was looking at the screen so I would remember where those parts were. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I can't do that in the real world. Uh -huh. And so I made sure not to look because I didn't want it to be visual. Yeah. You well, know? you know, it's really true. I just thought of that. Uh, classical music, I played the violin uh, in, in the Alan Stevenson School Orchestra and all. We had music. Uh, you know, we were reading sure. music. Uh, a lot of it, you know, is, is uh, once you learn it, you become more expressive and freed. But I don't see that very often on stage. Do, you know, no, and then when there's you, no music and, and, and then when you open your eyes, you have somebody like Edge, the Edge from you two watching <laughs> yeah. over your shoulder, right? I mean, that's happening. Right, that happened at Jazz Fest. It's we were really organic. At 8 it? in the morning and I'm playing and I turn and look and, and uh, the Edge was standing over my shoulder <laughs> watching it. And, uh, and, and it was kind of great because uh, and, and he really, he loved it, and, and I remember his wife was there, and she was, you know, like, well, and I, I felt comfortable because this is, Family you know, feeling, I, yeah. I, I do say that, you know, I play very fluidly, mm -hmm. not, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, erratically, so it's very fluid, so he's watching the bar moving very fluidly. Uh, it was kind of great, because at, at Bruce's show, he, he was there, and got to introduce him, you know, I reintroduced myself, mm -hmm. remember that, and he said, yeah, and I introduced him to Mona, but, um, uh, there was another time, because I knew he doesn't do that. Uh, I was doing a thing for uh, the premiere of Parenthood movie with, oh, yeah. with mm -hmm. Steve Martin. So there's a band. There's me on steel. And next to me is a guitar player. Next to him is another guitar player. Okay. Okay. And this is where the fast twitch comes in. So we're playing a song, and uh, Eddie Van Halen walks in. Oh, my God. <laughs> and we all look up, and there's Eddie. <laughs> And so it was my solo. I played a solo. And when I was done playing the solo, I turn and look at the guitar player like, okay, I did mine. You know, yes, you're supposed you're, to do yours. Yeah. And he shook his head no. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. wow. And, and he looked at the other guitar player. <laughs> yeah. And he shook his head oh, no. And no. looked at the first one. <laughs> and then he looked down at me. And this is all happening like in a split second. Right? Yeah. Like three of right. us are sitting here. It would be me going this and this. this, this. And so I just thought, well, he doesn't do this. <laughs> and so I took another solo. Good for you. <laughs> and, and it was like fine. You know, it, it, it wasn't to show off or anything. It right. was just like it needed the solo. Right. Our guest, uh, Marty Rifkin. Marty, um, <laughs> we're out of here. Where can people hear your music? Uh, it's j just all. Uh, it's hard to say, you know, because I work for so many different artists. Yeah. So it, it, I don't have, you have a particular. A favorite? Any... Uh, no, uh, no? Uh, not really. But, you know, I mean, if they want to look up the jazz fest thing or. or yeah. Uh, uh, just in general, if they do a search for who I've played with, then, then they, right, can, so just they search can find it. Marty Rifkin, R-A-F-K-I-N. They'll find you somewhere. <laughs> They'll find me somewhere. Oh. I I'm easy to find. Well, this was another fast hour. Yeah. Oh, boy. This was great, guys. Yeah. Thank you, Marty Robin. Rifkin. Great fun. Uh, friend and fantastic musician. And thank you so much for coming on the show. Phil. Yeah. I'm Ted. Oh, I'm Phil, I guess. And you've been I, listening well, to... I'm Phil. filling time. Let's yeah. just put it that You're, way. You've been listening to Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show. And once again, we can say to you, see you next week. You bet. You bet.